Welcome to another Turnstile Tours virtual program. I'm Stephen D.W. coming to you from uh, what used to be Lenape land here in uh, Flushing, Queens, New York. And today on this virtual program, we are going to talk about, well, it's uh, it's Black History Month and uh, we're uh, right around the celebration of the 220th anniversary of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So today we're going to look at black sailors and ship workers uh, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. A great story with uh, uh, Andrew Gustafson, who's going to take us through that uh, in just a few moments. So let's uh, get into our conversation today with Andrew Gustafson, who's done a lot of research on this topic. Uh, the uh, If you've read any literature about uh, seafaring in the early 19th century or earlier, or uh, uh, even Moby Dick, you know that uh, the maritime world is of course a, an uh, international world and therefore uh, a world that's quite diverse and uh, brings together people from all backgrounds. Uh, but for much of the 19th century, that wasn't so much the case around the Brooklyn Navy Yard and in the U.S. Navy. So uh, Andrew will come on here in just a moment and he'll uh, tell us about how those changes took place and uh, the sort of the tides of change in, in uh, racial politics around the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, I'm really looking forward to learning something about that from him. So, so Andrew, if you're out there, why don't you go ahead and, and come on here and, and set us up for, for this story. Uh, about uh, black sailors and uh, ship workers. Hello, welcome. Yeah, hi, oh. Stefan. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to, to be here and, and to be uh, talking about this, this uh, topic um, with you. And uh, I know you're so knowledgeable in the maritime uh, domain. So I'm excited to have this conversation also to, um, you know, hear the uh, comments um, and insights that the, that the audience has. So again, feel, feel free to, yeah. to drop, drop them in. Um, it's like we've been Howie out there and Marilyn, a couple of regular attendees. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about this. This is a, uh, really a weak spot for me in my, my knowledge about uh, waterfront but uh, I, I i'm really excited to learn more so so uh, yeah that's, well, where do we begin our story yeah well i mean i think we should begin by just acknowledging that we're obviously both a couple of white guys uh talking about this topic but i, I do want to you know acknowledge that the great group of scholars that will um recognize throughout the program today and the scholarship that's continuing to be done um uh to tell this story and and so after the program we'll also give uh, you a reading list of of some great books to um, uh, to take a look at, so you can uh, learn more uh, for yourself. For the first part of the program, um, I really want to uh, acknowledge a great book that I recognize uh, that that I um, want to encourage everybody um, to read, uh, which is called um, Black Jacks, uh, which is by Jeffrey Bolster. It came out in, I think in 1997, but it's a really great book about like you're saying, this long tradition of uh, really kind of um, the incredible diversity of the, the maritime world. And really what we're gonna talk about today is, uh, is this 100 year period from the end of the Civil War uh, all the way up until the closure of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and unfortunately for most of this period, this is really a story about the closure of that maritime domain and uh, the sort of erosion of these long traditions um, of uh, black seafaring uh, and black participation in the maritime trades. And so, um, you know, hopefully by the end of the story, it, it becomes a little bit more hopeful, but um, really, you know, un unfortunately, a lot of this is, is a story about, um, you know, the kind of rise of segregation and what they call, uh, uh, or what Bolster calls Jim Crow uh, at, at sea. Um, yeah, you mentioned, for example, um, you know, Moby Dick uh, and the diversity that we see in these crews um, on, on ships in the early 19th century. And that, that's a really, really important point. You know, um, during this period, going to sea was uh, an opportunity um, for African Americans, a way to kind of um, gain autonomy. Uh, gain economic opportunity that was not available to them uh, on land. Um, 
Sure. And, and wasn't uh, Frederick Douglass, didn't he start out as, a, I, I know that part of his slave time, as I understand, is in slavery. Yeah, so, so that's a really good point, because we're, we're going to kind of talk about four distinct groups. Uh, and I think talking about that um, hel helps us kind of uh, uh, distinguish them. So when we're talking about um, the world of, of seafaring and, and even talking about the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we need to talk about these distinct groups. Um, so on the one hand, we're talking about, you know, uniform sailors in the U.S. Navy. We're talking about civilian employees of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So those are the two main groups you're going to talk about sort of within the gates of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. But when we go sort of beyond the, to the wider waterfront, um, we're also going to be talking about, you know, civilian mariners. Um, and then people working in sort of other waterfront trades. And so that includes, you know, people working in the shipbuilding trades, you know, longshoremen, stevedores, things like that. Not necessarily people Fishermen, that uh, the Sandy Ground folks famously. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Sandy Ground and other uh, fishermen, like the folks at Sandy Ground? Of, of course. Yeah. So when we talk about the waterfront, you know, there's this whole diverse world of, of people uh, and occupations. But if we kind of divide it into those four groups, you have Navy sailors, you have Navy employees, you have civilian sailors, and then you have sort of other waterfront workers. Um, and, you know, we have, um, for the most part, Black representation in all these groups um, in, the, in the early part of the 19th century. Now, you mentioned Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick Douglass, while he was a slave, uh, he actually uh, was trained to work in a shipyard, and he worked in, in shipyards in, in Baltimore. Um, primarily as uh, a, a chipper and a caulker. So basically the people who uh, made uh, boats waterproof, uh, you know, using oakum and tar, um, sort of putting it in between the joints. And, and so, you know, in a place like Baltimore, um, after the Civil War, you know, free black people actually became very prominent in, in the shipbuilding industry, especially in, in the caulking trades. So yeah, so you have this long tradition of not only going to sea, but also building ships and, and working on the waterfront um, for, for people um, as well. Now, again, we're going to talk primarily about the period after the Civil War, but I think it's important to sort of see where, where we're, we're headed uh, in the years leading up to, um, uh, up to the Civil War. Um, and so I'm going to pull up some slides here. Just bear with me for one second. Yeah, I, I think your microphone's been brushing against your beard a little oh, bit there, sorry. so uh, that's all right. Just a little extra, little extra sound here, competition for us. Sorry. Uh, I, I'll try not to move so much. I, I have all these <laughs> papers rustling around, so I was trying to avoid uh, that sound. Um, <laughs> Sounds like your desk looks like my desk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, and Cindy, I just need you to uh, enable my screen share. And we should acknowledge Cindy, of course, is back there, backing us up, making sure all this moves smoothly. And uh, I'll keep an eye out for your questions out there, folks. There we go. OK, so uh, when we talk about um, African-Americans in, in the Navy. Um, this actually goes back to the very earliest days of the US Navy uh, in the, the late uh, 18th century. Uh, and it really kind of hits a high point um, up to this time uh, during the War of 1812. Uh, and so here you can see this uh, artistic depiction that's in Washington DC of the Battle of Lake Erie in uh, 1813 uh, and uh, Oliver Hazard Perry. Um, and so at this time, um, you know, it's estimated that about 20% of all of the sailors in the Navy um, were African American. Um, but from that point forward, uh, we really start to see a, a decline in participation, really as a result of, um, I mean, for one, after the War of 1812, the Navy, the Navy shrinks. Um, but the other thing that we see is the sort of entrenchment of, um, you know, racial politics uh, in the United States. Um, and, you know, issues of um, segregation becoming um, sort of national political uh, issues. And so, you know, as a result, um, we see, um, you know, it, it go, it, it start to become uh, policy, both within the Navy on the civilian side, uh, as well as uh, on the uniform side. Um, 
And so this actually has an impact as well on um, uh, civilian mariners. And so we actually see that impact kind of uh, go both ways. Um, so just to give you a couple numbers as an example, in 1825, 18% um, of all seafarers uh, setting out from uh, New York uh, were Black. Uh, by 1866, that number had fallen to 4%. Um, and so wow. why do we see this, this decline um, across the board in this type of participation? Um, and, and so there are a number of different factors that we can uh, look at. You know, the first, like I mentioned, is that the, the divisive politics of slavery uh, had started to work their way into the world uh, of seafaring. Um, for one, we had the rise of fugitive slave laws. So African-Americans, free blacks from the North, didn't wanna go to sea if they might wind up in a Southern port uh, where they could be arrested or, or frankly kidnapped. Um, and taken back into slavery, whether they were you know, born free or had escaped slavery. Um, the other thing you see is the rise of recruiters, um, uh, what were called crimps. Uh, and, and so basically you see- I was gonna say, that, recruiters is a, a very, very nice word for it. <laughs> yes. So these were people that uh, basically, you know, ships needed uh, men to work on them. Uh, and so these were, uh, you know, sort of the, the hiring bosses. Um, and so this became much more sort of, um, it became a, a much kind of bigger money uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, and so as a result, what you see is that these recruiters started to favor white immigrants over black sailors, regardless of their experience. Um, they just needed bodies, uh, whether they'd been to sea before or not. Um, and what happened is in a place like New York, you find that where you had you know, frankly, much smaller, less well-connected black communities found it much more difficult to kind of tap into these networks um, for, uh, of recruiters and basically get those jobs on the ships. Well, well you um, mentioned Crips and that, that brings up sort of an interesting question. I don't know uh, how well we're able to answer it, but uh, you know, the conditions for sailors at this time were tough. And uh, when you're on board a ship, you know, the, the captain's word is law. And, uh, and this because it was a legal issue throughout the 19th century and even into the 20th century about what, uh, how much autonomy a sailor has. You know, you have responsibility to your ship even today. You know, we see uh, sailors, you know, seafarers who are, are stuck on ships, a company goes bust and they can't leave their ship because there's responsibility to that. So uh, a seafarer has sort of a, a different level of freedom than a person on shore does to begin with. Do we have, uh, do we have records? Do we know of ships that were manned by uh, people who were enslaved? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that definitely uh, happened. When we talk about uh, the US Navy, they officially um, banned um, having slaves on ships. And you had many uh, officers in the US Navy who were slave owners. Um, so that was banned in the early 19th century, but it was a law that was basically ignored, um, especially within the, um, the Revenue Cutter Service, which is a precursor to the US Coast Guard. Um, yeah, it was, it was wow. common, common practice. Um, in, in terms of ships, yeah, you, you, you definitely saw that um, in the South as well, uh, coastwise shipping and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly happened. But you know, the other thing that we see in this period in the 1840s and 50s is just like with recruitment, it, it's kind of becoming big money business. So is actual shipping. And so you're seeing fewer you know, uh, sort of owner operators, captains that own their ships. Um, right. And so, uh, you know, there's, you also see with the advance of technology, you have shorter journeys. Uh, and so therefore, uh, if you have a long journey, you know, you need, everybody needs to get along. You need to have a certain amount, you know, sailors need a certain amount of autonomy. Uh, and that starts to be undermined um, as, you know, journeys become, become quicker. Uh, and then there's less of a need for, you know, a skilled, uh, basically a skilled crew. Um, yeah. Uh, so when we look, I want to yeah. touch on here because we have this image in front of us. Uh, so we see a couple of uh, figures in this picture who seem to be African Americans. Uh, yep. And do we are those specific individuals? Do we does the artist tell us who they are, or does the the image tell us who they are? Yeah. So this is this is uh, Cyrus Tiffany. Um, so we we do know who that person is. 
and I wish I could tell you more uh, about about Cyrus Tiffany. Um, but yeah, we, we you know we do have some records, um, but they're not totally complete. You know, when we talk about uh, the Navy Yard specifically, uh, we actually basically have no employment records prior to 1840. Um, so a lot of this is kind of lost in the in the in the mists of mists of history. Um, but yeah, so like I mentioned before, this is this is an example of um, you know uh, African Americans working in the shipbuilding trade. Um, this is the uh, Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company of Baltimore, uh, which was you know a group of uh, some who had been previously enslaved, some who were free black people um, who started a um, a shipbuilding company uh, in in Baltimore that was very successful, and it was on the site of this property where Frederick Douglass had actually worked a couple of, uh, you know, basically a generation um, before. Um, but yeah, so I want to take a look specifically at the Navy as we start to approach uh, the Civil War. Um, so basically, um, you know, you were asking about, you know, enslaved people being on, uh, working on ships. When we talk about U.S. Navy yards um, in the early 19th century, they'd actually banned the employment, quote unquote employment, basically, uh, the use of enslaved labor on Navy yards. Um, again, a law that was basically totally ignored because it was very lucrative business for white officers to rent out their enslaved people to the government um, for labor. Um, but you also see it on the, um, on the uniform side. So in 1839, um, the US Navy began to crack down on black recruitment and, and greatly reduce it. Um, and this was actually, uh, unfortunately done at the insistence of uh, uh, Commodore Lewis Warrington, um, who had, was working at the Washington Navy Yard, um, but also Isaac Chauncey, who's a long time, the longest serving commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, who also um, by this time had risen to the um, position of, of Secretary of the Navy. So Isaac Chauncey like, is a very complicated figure because he was actually a champion of African-Americans uh, serving in the Navy uh, during the War of 1812. Um, he was the overall commander of American forces on the Great Lakes, um, but uh, he also uh, did own slaves, um, and you know he was sort of the one of the driving forces behind this great reduction in black participation in, in the U.S. Navy uh, in the decades approaching um, the Civil War. So you know we see this. So we see fewer and fewer black mariners uh, working on civilian ships. We see fewer, in, and and so that has a kind of knock-on effect, which is. Um, a lot of uh, sailors serving in the US Navy kind of learn the skills working on the civilian maritime side. And so you basically cut off this pipeline. Um, at the same time, you have recruiters uh, who are essentially segregating the industry because most recruiters, they don't make their money from uh, basically, um, you know, for like headhunting fees by delivering crews. They make their money because they also run boarding houses for right. the sailors when they're on land. And in the 1840s and 50s, they start to segregate these boarding houses. Um, so basically what you're seeing in the years leading up to the Civil War is this tradition of black seafaring and uh, black work in the maritime trades starts to be undermined. Um, and during the Civil War is where we see, uh, again, a high point of black participation in the US Navy. Um, but we also see the, the uh, segregation really start to become institutionalized uh, with, within, the, uh, within the force. Um, and so, you know, like you asked before, um, you know, we want to talk about real people and, and who are people's names. I think that's, that's yeah, really yeah, important. Very, that's and very it's something we did a presentation last year that was about um, the institution of slavery at the Brooklyn Navy prior to the Civil War. And one of the things that was really difficult about that presentation is that because we have so few records, there were very few actual people that we could talk about. Um, with this presentation, we, we don't have that problem, um, fortunately, or not the, to the same degree. Obviously, there are a lot of silences and a lot of people's uh, stories who are missing, um, but we're able to populate the story much, much more readily than we could in the period uh, prior to the Civil War. Um, I hope that means so, you're going to tell us the name of the person uh, squatting in the front yeah, center. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So just to set up this <laughs> image. Um, so in 1861, after these kind of two decades of declining uh, black recruitment, um, just 5% of the Navy uh, is made up of African-American sailors. And I should say, 
for basically the entire period that we're talking about in this presentation, we're talking about enlisted sailors. We are not talking about officers. You know, we don't have the first black officers in the U.S. Navy until the uh, 1940s. Wow. Um, and so, um, you know, during the Civil War, we reach a high point uh, of 18,000 African Americans serving in uniform, which is about 20% uh, of the entire Navy. So similar numbers to what we had during the War uh, of 1812. Um, now, many of these people were um, were free black people from the North um, who joined. Um, in many cases, these were people were called contraband. So these were runaway slaves um, who, uh, who joined the Navy. Um, now there were entire units that were organized of quote unquote contrabands um, in the US Army. The US Navy is much, much smaller than the US Army during the Civil War. Um, but this is, this is a, an early example of this, and it involves a ship with close connections um, to Brooklyn. This is the USS Monitor, which was built at the Continental Iron Works um, in 1862. Um, and while and it's- Bushwick, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, well, Greenpoint, yeah. Greenpoint, it's Bushwick yeah. Inlet, yep. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so this person you see crouching in the foreground, this is Sia Hewlett Carter, um, and he was a crew member of the Monitor. Um, he was enslaved at Shirley Plantation in Virginia, and on May 18th, 1862, he rode a boat, he escaped the plantation, rode a boat out to the monitor that was sitting out in the James River, uh, and asked for, uh, you know, asylum, and uh, he enlisted in the Navy, um, and wow. he served th three years, the, the remainder of the war, and he survived the sinking of the monitor, which, which sank off the coast of Cape Hatteras, uh, just about seven months uh, after after he joined the Navy. Um, and so, you know, there's a real, um, you know, tradition of, um, of Black service um, from the Civil War um, in the Navy. So eight Black sailors were served the Medal of Honor. Um, among them was a New Yorker, Thomas English, who served aboard the USS uh, New Ironsides. Um, he was a, what was called a, a signal quartermaster. So sort of the equivalent of a chief petty officer. Um, so you did have African-Americans who were serving as uh, what we call non-commissioned officers. Um, so basically the highest uh, enlisted ranks. Um, and so he received the Medal of Honor for steering his ship through the batteries at, at Fort Fisher, North Carolina in uh, 1864. Um, however, so you have this increase in, in participation, but you, like I said before, you have um, basically the institutionalization of segregation. Uh, and again, this is driven in part by another figure with close connections to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, David Dixon Porter. Uh, and so he starts to create uh, um, segregated units. Um, so essentially on board a ship, like if you had a gun crew or if you had a shore party, uh, they would be all black or all white. You didn't have integrated units uh, within uh, within the ship. Now, when we flip over to the this civilian is during side- during wartime that they have these, these segregated units. Yeah, during wartime. Yep. Okay. Because I'm really struck by the, this, the fact that uh, it, during the War of 1812 and then the Civil War, that you have this, these huge rises in uh, increases in uh, uh, Black participation in the Navy. And that sort of makes me wonder about the time in between where the Navy is more sort of, this is less a crisis orientation and more just work. And was there a role, and I definitely want to get back to where you were in a moment, but uh, in times of relative peace, was uh, there, did patronage play a role in, uh, uh, certainly it's something we think of as more late 19th century, but d what role did, if any, did patronage play in segregation for jobs within the Navy Yard? Sure, um, so it played a huge role. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, on, so that, that, that's a great um, transition because I want to talk about what's happening at the actual Brooklyn Navy Yard with the civilian employees. So obviously the Civil War is a, is a boom time. You know, we reach about 7,000 workers. So that was a high point um, up to that time in the yard's employment. Uh, and um, according to, um, I wanna get the historian's uh, name right, um, but uh, let me find it here. Um, 
I'll, I'll get, oh, John Sharp, sorry. Uh, according to historian John Sharp, who, who's looked at the employment records of the Navy Yard, um, from what he could find between 1809 and 1890, there are no records of African-Americans working at the Navy Yard. Wow. Which is crazy. You obviously had African-Americans in that space, um, but mostly as, as uniformed sailors. So, um, so th there were very few opportunities. And in some ways the Navy was, was proud of this uh, because this, again, it was really a, a patronage system and these were largely sort of political appointments. Uh, and so you kind of trade jobs for votes. Uh, and if you have people who can't vote for various reasons, um, including people who are enslaved, um, you know, why, why give them that job? And in 1862, the commandant of the Navy Yard, Hiram Paulding, uh, he said this to the New York Times, there is not a colored person employed in the Navy Yard, nor has there been since the day I assumed command or before that time, as, as far as I know. Wow. Um, yeah, and so, so while we have large participation on the uniform side, we don't see it on the civilian side. And so let's, let's take a look at what's kind of happening uh, after the Civil War. Um, so first of all, the Navy is drastically reduced in size. Um, so it's at a peak of uh, 58,000 in 1865. Uh, 12 years later, it's just 8,000 people that are in the whole, whole US Navy. Um, at the same time, um, the civilian employment at the yard falls from 7,000 um, to under 1,000. Um, now, so we see this reduction in, in the force um, in part because of kind of shifting priorities uh, within the, the federal government. Um, but starting in the 1870s, you know, black sailors, they start to be recruited exclusively for jobs such as landsmen and messmen. So landsmen is basically someone who works on a ship but doesn't really know how ships work. So people who don't have any sort of experience um, and messmen uh, or people who are basically doing chores, you know, serving food, right, cooking, right. doing laundry, stuff yeah. like that. Uh, well, I and know this is a tradition. Part of the century, you know, late 19th, early 20th century uh, commercial shipping that was, uh, you know, we also see segregation and maybe you'll get to this, I don't know, but, uh, uh, but typically you have people who are working in the mess, your cook and your uh, steward are African-Americans or, or black people, I should say. And, uh, uh, you know, that's that uh, you might have some deckhands, uh, but uh, that was very typical uh, in commercial as well as uh, naval shipping. Yeah, that, that's right. Because what, what you're seeing is because we're now approaching a generation or two that are sort of excluded from the seafaring trades, you start right. to see that um, that sort of those skills uh, within the black community um, start to erode. And so there are are fewer and fewer skilled sailors out there because they're not afforded the opportunity. Um, the and yeah, that, pipeline, you know, if we can look at it in that way. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so this we see, um, you know, a, a tradition that, you know, it existed before the Civil War, but it starts to become entrenched in the 1870s and persists uh, really through uh, World War II. Um, but when, and so here we can see an example of uh, someone working as a, as a steward uh, in the Brooklyn Naval Hospital um, in, uh, in 1920. That's so why I want to jump, jump ahead to this, uh, uh, into this image. Um, but, you know, what we see is that um, Black enlistment actually stays relatively stable uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. It's about 10% uh, of the force. Um, and this in part is like you were saying before, we are, we are although we're not at war, uh, we're in this growth stage when there's a, a great demand for, um, for manpower uh, within the Navy because we're right. building new steel battleships and, and we, need, we need a lot of people. Um, but there's pushback uh, against this. Uh, and so in 1899, uh, the Navy creates something called the Landsmen in Training Program or Landsmen for Training. Um, which the idea is to create sort of an apprenticeship system. So if you've never been to sea before, uh, you can basically make your way into these um, skilled ratings for actually operating the ship. Um, and this is done in part because uh, the people within the Navy don't like the fact that they have to recruit skilled African-American sailors to take these jobs because they're some of the only uh, experienced people that are out there. So they're like, let's oh. take 
white people and train them to do these jobs instead. Wow. So there's another instance um, starting in 1899 where you see the, the undermining um, of sort of, um, you know, uh, black achievement um, within this. Yeah, within this it, it sounds like you're, you're saying that uh, for white people uh, who are lower class, they, they sort of have, there's a slight evening of opportunity. There's equity for white people as a way of decreasing equity uh, across racial lines. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, and so, again, we'll, we'll shift over to the, the civilian side again. And I want to talk about some people who, uh, but before we do that, I want to talk about, you know, although this is a time of sort of declining African-American participation in the Navy, there are some, you know, prominent um, African-Americans who intersect with the story of the Navy Yard uh, in this period in the late 19th century. One of them who definitely deserves a mention is, is Matthew Henson. Uh, Matthew Henson was an Arctic explorer. explorer. Um, he was born in Maryland, uh, you know, worked at sea his, his entire life, basically, and he became um, the valet. So he was basically the kind of uh, personal assistant um, to uh, Robert Peary. But in reality, he was his second in command. Uh, he was you know, one of the most skilled and accomplished uh, members of his uh, expeditions, both at sea as well as uh, going across the ice in, in Greenland and uh, on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and he accompanied Peary on, on seven expeditions, including, you know, several of those expeditions either began or ended at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So uh, he was on the expedition in 1894, which uh, unfortunately was to steal the Cape York meteorite, uh, which was a sacred object for the uh, uh, Inuit people in, in Greenland. And uh, he sold it to the um, Museum of Natural History after it sat at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, for, for many years while he haggled over the price that he was going to get for it. Peary did. Um, and, and he also accompanied Peary um, in his uh, supposed uh, uh, achievement of the North Pole in, in 1909. Uh, there's question about whether they reached the North Pole at all, um, but wherever they got to, Henson got there first. Um, <laughs> and Peary didn't, you know, did very little to publicly acknowledge the um, uh, achievements of, uh, of Matthew Henson. Um, and uh, he, he basically got no public accolades at the time. Um, thanks to President Teddy Roosevelt, um, who knew of, you know, how talented uh, Henson was, uh, he actually helped get him a, an appointment as a clerk uh, at the Custom House uh, in Lower Manhattan. And so that's basically where he spent the rest of his, uh, of his career. Um, and he was admitted into the Explorers Club, which is based in New York in, in 1937. Um, so we, we can be proud of, of his uh, connections to New York, even though he's a, a, a Marylander. Um, and so, like I said, it, it's not as if, you know, African-Americans disappear from the Navy during this, this time period. And, and you do have, uh, you know, some important achievements. This is uh, John Henry Turpin. Uh, he joined the Navy um, in the 1890s, and he would eventually, you know, achieve a couple of important milestones. Uh, he was from Long Branch, New Jersey, um, and he joined in 1896, and he'd become uh, the first black uh, chief petty officer in the Navy and one of the first master divers uh, in, in the Navy. Um, he also served in 1898 aboard the USS Maine, uh, which was built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and he was on it when it exploded uh, in, in Havana Harbor, which uh, sparked the beginning of the uh, Spanish-American War. Um, so uh, another uh, important black sailor with um, connections to the uh, to the yard. Um, on the civilian side, uh, what we see during this time um, is opportunities start to open up. And this starts uh, in 1883 when you have the uh, passage of the uh, of civil service reform. Um, mm, yeah. So yeah. across the federal workforce, you start to see more um, opportunities for African-Americans as the patronage system starts to be dismantled a little bit, but not totally. Um, but you, you start to see black employment increase greatly in the, um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, under the administration of, um, of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and so this is when another person enters the Navy Yard story. Uh, this is uh, William Holmes. Uh, 
and he started working at the Navy Yard in 19, uh, 1904. Uh, he actually spent 40 years uh, at the Yard. Um, and he's uh, significant um, because um, towards the end of his tenure uh, at the Yard in 1942, um, we launched a series of tank landing ships uh, at the yard um, during World War II. Uh, and they asked, uh, usually what happens when you have a ship sponsor, this is the person who hits the bottle against the ship and it goes down yeah. the shipways. Usually what happens is there's, you know, politicians or Navy brass, you know, they pick um, their wife or their mother or their daughter. It's, it's always a woman who does this. Uh, what they did with the construction of these eight LSTs is they act, asked um, long tenured civilian employees to nominate the sponsors. Uh, huh. And so William uh, nominated his wife, uh, Gertrude. Uh, and in 1942, she christened uh, LST 314, uh, which was the first ship built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard that was sponsored uh, by an African American. Wow. Uh, and here we can see uh, William Henry Holmes. This is his um, registration card for the draft uh, during World War I. Um, and so you can see you know, he's working here at, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And by this point, he'd, he'd already been working at the Navy Yard for uh, about about 14 years. Um, I so love that photo that you showed us of the launch. I mean, that for me, that really brings it home because and you talk about the, the, the traditions around this. And I see that photo and I'm brought back to, you know, uh, the Missouri. And uh, do I recall correctly, that was uh, Harry Truman's daughter? Daughter, who, uh, yeah, Margaret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just to, to know that to, without seeing the actual photo of, of the, uh, you know, of the christening moment itself, but to know that this happened in the same space, that contrast is really striking. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, a really important moment in, in the yard's history and one that isn't, uh, isn't told a lot. Um, no. So yeah, a modest ship, but, but an important milestone. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, so during this time, the first decade of the 20th century, we start to see, you know, more and more African Americans working uh, at the yard. But we should also keep in mind that the African American population of Brooklyn uh, was still relatively small um, uh, at this point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I've been that's something I've been wondering this whole time. When you say percentage of the Navy Yard, my question has always been. How does that compare to the percentage of the, you know, the racial breakdown of the community around the Navy Yard? Yeah. So, you know, at the, in the year 1800, uh, you know, we had a much larger African-American population in Brooklyn, but as the population of the city boomed, um, the, that, that, that relative population declined. Now, there were significant African-American communities. You know, we have to mention here uh, Weeksville, which was really the first black, free black settlement um, in Kings County. Um, but we also have a growing community in the areas around the Navy Yard in, in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, uh, and Vinegar Hill as well. But if we look at the overall population of Brooklyn um, in 1900, um, African-Americans only make up one and a half percent um, of the borough's population. So wow. it's relatively small. Now that would, um, in the next uh, few decades, uh, would really uh, take off considerably, but I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. So the African-American workforce is small, but the overall African-American population in the city uh, is also relatively small. Um, now, there was progress that was made uh, under the administration of Teddy Roosevelt uh, and William Howard Taft uh, in civilian employment, uh, as well as uh, within the enlisted ranks. Um, that's basically all undone under the administration of Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was really an arch uh, segregationist. Um, and this had particular impact on the US Navy because his secretary of the Navy uh, was one of the greatest, um, I would call, uh, racial terrorists uh, in American history, um, Josephus uh, Daniels. Uh, so they were both uh, committed white supremacists. In 1913, one of the first things Fred Woodrow Wilson does when he comes into office is that he segregates the entire federal workforce and, and starts to strictly enforce segregation uh, within uh, Washington, D.C. 
Um, Josephus Daniels was involved in one of the most notorious incidents in, in American history, which was called the Wilmington Coup of uh, 1898. Um, so he was the publisher of a newspaper called the News and Observer, uh, and he orchestrated a, a violent racial terror attack that toppled the city's interracial government um, wow. and basically led to the, uh, you know, violent enforcement of, of Jim Crow within Wilmington and across the state uh, of, uh, of North Carolina. So uh, he was a very, very bad, bad person and his politics aligned very closely with Wilson's, which is why he was appointed secretary uh, of the Navy. Um, you know, this incident, you know, these politics kind of came to the fore at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1915 um, during the launch of the USS Arizona. So you can see Daniels uh, standing there um, sort of turned turn to the side in that uh, white jacket. Um, so they invited a delegation from Air, the state of Arizona to come and uh, be there for the launch. Um, and among the delegation uh, were Tom and Carrie Turner, um, who were African Americans. Um, once word of their inclusion uh, leaked out, uh, the governor of Arizona, uh, Governor Hunt, rescinded the invitation under pressure from the Navy Department. Uh, and the entire affair, the launching, as well as the luncheon that followed it, um, was officially designated as, as whites, uh, whites only. Um, now, African Americans did serve um, you know, in, in significant numbers uh, during World War I. Again, there was a need for manpower. Um, but following World War I is when Daniels uh, starts to really enforce his uh, segregationist policies on the uniformed Navy. Um, and in 1919, he ends the recruitment of all African Americans uh, into the Navy. Um, and this is a policy that would remain in place uh, for, for 13 years, actually. Uh, now, by this time, um, the you know, the largest proportion of African Americans serving in the Navy were serving uh, as messmen and stewards and things like that. Uh, and Daniel's belief was uh, we didn't need African Americans to do these jobs. Instead, they could all be done by um, Filipinos. Uh, and so Filipino stewards uh, became predominant and would remain so really for the next, you know, 50, 60 years. Um, and as a result of that, you actually have the growth of, of Filipino yeah, I, communities uh, in the areas around the Navy Yard. So Vinegar Hill and Clinton Hill both right. had large uh, Filipino enclaves. Yeah, sorry, you had a question? No, 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 no. I just, uh, I knew that, I, I knew that Filipinos had been, had been, become part of the Navy and part of the, the neighborhood around it. But, uh, and of course, this wouldn't have been the case if not for the Spanish-American War, right? Because we didn't really have a relationship with the Philippines before then. Correct. Um, so the Spanish-American War was, was an opportunity for, um, segregationists to basically force uh, African Americans uh, out, out of the Navy because you now had this this pool of, of labor that they could uh, tap into that they found less objectionable um, than having black sailors uh, on ships. And so, as, you know, as a result of this policy by 1932, um, the proportion of uh, black sailors had fallen to 0.5%. Uh, so there were only 441 black sailors in the entire U.S. Navy uh, by 1932. Um, you know, another interesting thing that's happening at this time uh, is that in 1915, um, Woodrow Wilson um, stages an intervention in Haiti, and we would have uh, American troops occupying Haiti for the next 19 years. Um, and this actually became an important um, moment for African-American activists who spoke out against the fact that we're using the US Navy uh, to uh, occupy you know, the world's first uh, black republic. Um, right, and right. so many people within the Navy, African-Americans you know, did not feel comfortable uh, about you know, what the Navy was doing in Haiti as well. And, and many groups in Brooklyn, uh, because the Brooklyn Navy Yard was so intimately connected with the occupation, um, in fact, one of the first things they did was send sailors down to Haiti and take all of the gold out of the National Bank of Haiti and bring it back to New York for quote unquote wow. safekeeping. Um, but yeah, so the local uh, NAACP as well as the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture really spoke out um, against the occupation of Haiti uh, during this time period. Um, okay, so we have 
like 10 minutes left to talk about all of World War II, which is, you know, <laughs> there's so many significant stories. Fortunately, we've done a lot of programs about World War II uh, <laughs> already. Um, and so you can go back and, and look at some of those. And there's lots of great resources for um, oral history um, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard during World War II that we'll share as well. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to talk about kind of how transformative World War II really was um, for African Americans uh, across the Navy, but um, also at the uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so what's happened? Let's start first with talking about the civilian workforce. Um, so first of all, it also declines pretty dr drastically in the years leading up to World War II. So um, we don't build any ships between 1919 and 1929, uh, and the workforce fell to below 3,000. Um, by the middle of the 1930s, it starts to rebound, though, um, because they do some major um, renovation projects for the yard uh, under the Works Progress Administration, so, so part of the New Deal. Uh, and this really starts to boost the overall workforce, but the Black workforce as well. So by 1934, uh, it's about 6% of the workforce is African American. Um, but this does not keep pace as the yard continues to grow through the late 1930s. And so by 1941, it's actually just two percent huh. and so um in the in the years immediately leading up to world war ii we we see a couple of important changes that take place uh, number one is in the summer of 1941 uh under pressure from african-american activists uh to do something about black economic opportunity or the lack thereof um president Roosevelt signs Executive Order 8802, which prohibits racial discrimination in hiring um, by the federal government or federal contractors. So that applies to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so that's, that's a positive thing on paper, um, although in reality, the opportunities remain um, uh, quite limited. Um, and so throughout World War II, the vast majority of African Americans are hired as what are called unclassified employees. Um, so they have uh, a job for the duration of the war um, plus six months. Now, this is also a time when we have women coming to work in the yard starting in the summer of 1942 in the production uh, jobs. Uh, and these are important milestones, but we should also keep in mind the fact that um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we had a very long tenured, highly skilled workforce. Uh, and you also had entrenched uh, trade unions, um, especially the American Federation of Labor. Uh, and so as a result, um, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for people to step into these classified jobs. Um, and so as a result, the employment level of both African Americans and of women at the Brooklyn Navy Yard was some of the lowest among any shipyards in the country. Um, the Navy Yard was just so big that it just employed, you know, so many women and so many African Americans, but proportionally it was, it was relatively small. You saw much higher levels of this type of employment at other shipyards in New York Harbor. So for example, this photo comes from the Todd shipyard uh, up, in, up in Red Hook, um, because you didn't have this sort of entrenched cadre of long tenured employees, number one. Number two, places like Todd shipyard and other shipyards were doing, <coughs> excuse me, um, much less technically complex work. So building a battleship was extremely, extremely complicated. And again, I've said this so many times on, on programs when we've talked about this subject. This is not to say that women and people of color could not do these jobs. It's just they didn't have 20, 30, 40 years of experience leading up to World War II to get those skilled jobs. Right, um, and, and, and so and that's Abby why- an interesting point here. Uh, so we, you've brought in women into the story. What can? How much can you speak specifically to the role that uh, uh, women of color, that females of color, played in the uh, in the shipyards, whether Todd or at uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Sure. So at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you know, they started the recruitment of women um, for production jobs in the summer of 1942. There were 125 women that were appointed. Um, 12 of them were African-American. Um, so, you know, you have about uh, 10%. Uh, and another uh, important um, thing to uh, mention uh, was the fact that of the 6,000 women that were tested for this initial phase, um, the highest score on that civil service exam was actually achieved 
uh, by an African American woman, although her name uh, has since been uh, lost to history, uh, unfortunately. The other place where you see women and women of color working at the yard, even before World War II, uh, is working in the flag and uniform shops uh, of the yard. Um, so they were definitely there um, even, even, before, uh, even before World War II. So, so not a lot of stories, but the stories we have are sound really important and impressive. Yeah, so here, for example, this is Alberta Day. Um, so she was in the, one of the early cohorts of women coming to work in the yard. Uh, and it's significant uh, also because uh, women were restricted from working on board ships uh, prior to 1944. Um, they had a separate pay scale. They had different um, uh, titles, uh, job titles. Um, but Alberta Day was one of the first women. Um, she actually was allowed to work on an aircraft carrier in uh, May of 1944. So she was one of the first women who got to work on board ships. And this photo of her appeared uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, newspaper. So, so we've talked in other programs about the welding work that there was welding happening, but it was not on ship. They would do the pre or the sub assembly off ship and then men would do the final assembly on the ship, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so. You know, you start to see more recruitment in 1942, and in the summer of 1943, the Navy launches a major recruitment drive in, in African American communities. Um, however, within a matter of weeks, uh, you see headlines like this uh, in um, mostly in the Black press and some of the other press as well, but mostly in in places like New York Age and Amsterdam News, um, basically attacking the Navy Yard for discriminatory practices. This didn't happen so much in hiring it happened more in promotion. So African-Americans could get a job in the yard, but they found it basically impossible uh, to be able to break into those uh, what were called classified uh, trades. And actually the Brooklyn Navy Yard had more civil rights complaints against it by civilian workers than any other federal installation in the entire country in World War II. Wow. Uh, in part because it was the biggest one that, 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 that contributed to part of it, but also, um, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, resistance um, to creating more opportunities um, for African Americans during the war. Um, now, when we shift over to the uh, military side, you know, in the early stages of the war, we still have, um, you know, this policy that African Americans are basically shunted into a limited category of, of ratings. So they're largely stewards, they're working on construction battalions, they're doing ammunition handling, um, things like that. That starts to change in 1942, early 1943, over the objections of the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Henry Knox. Um, but you know, despite being forced into these limited roles, uh, we have here on the right probably the most famous Navy steward in, in American history, uh, and that's Dory Miller. Um, Dory Miller served aboard the USS West Virginia at Pearl Harbor um, during the attack. Um, and uh, he received the Navy Cross for his uh, actions, um, trying to save his, his captain, uh, as well as manning an, an anti-aircraft gun. Um, so where's the New York or the Brooklyn Navy Yard connection here? Well, it's to this gentleman here on the left who was also there at Pearl Harbor. His name is Clark Simmons. Uh, he lived in Brooklyn for a long, long time, and he was a regular attendee of the USS Intrepid's uh, Pearl Harbor Day um, commemorations. And so there he is with, with Cindy. Um, he and Dory Miller were friends at, at Pearl Harbor. And I found a great story in an oral history that, again, we'll, we'll share after the fact. Um, but... Uh, Simmons uh, was worried about taking his swim tests uh, when he, he was in the Navy uh, and because he didn't know how to swim and was afraid he wouldn't be able to pass it. So his friend Dory Miller uh, stepped in uh, and volunteered to impersonate Clark and take his swim test for him. Uh, Dory Miller was a very accomplished athlete. You can also see here that uh, Dory Miller is, I don't know, 6'2", six, 6'3", six, Clark Simmons, least, yeah. maybe 5'6", yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, nobody noticed. And so it's a great little, uh, great little tidbit there. Um, so you start to see more uh, ratings open up to, to African-Americans uh, across the service just because there's a need for, for manpower and people in the Navy start to recognize that they are wasting a lot of talent. Um, however, it still takes time for African-Americans to be able to break into um, the, the officer corps, and we still have an entirely segregated force 
across the entire U.S. Navy, there are thousands and thousands of ships. Only two had uh, majority African-American crews. Um, wow. Both of them have New York connections. This is the USS uh, Mason, which was actually built up in Boston, but it's actually docked here uh, at Bush Terminal. So you can see what's today known as Industry City in the background, because uh, it did convoy duty, protecting um, convoys going back and forth across the North Atlantic. Uh, the other ship was called uh, PC-1264, uh, uh, 1264, which was built in the Bronx. It was commissioned in Manhattan uh, and also uh, protected convoys. That ship is actually still in New York. It's somewhere in the muds of, of the Arthur Kill in, in Rossville, Staten Island in the, uh, in the ship graveyard. Um, so uh, that, I don't know if it's completely sunk uh, beneath the waves yet, but it's, it's been there for, for many decades, unfortunately. Uh, last time this I talked is... about this uh, with folks, it, it was still, there were still a few pieces left, but that's it's been about three or four years since I've had an in-depth conversation about that particular vessel. Yeah. Uh, I know we have just a minute left here. Uh, we had one question I want to touch on uh, before we wrap up. Uh, and uh, we had someone in, uh, watching who wanted us to repeat the name of the sailor on the monitor, the uh, 1862 photo. Yeah, so it's uh, Sia Hewlett Carter. So S I A H Hewlett, H U L E T T Carter. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the last uh, last couple minutes, uh, we're going to go a few minutes over, but I, I wanted to um, you know touch on a few other important milestones in World War II, and then the years after World War II, because we're we're going to go right up to the yard's closure. Um, so. This is called the Golden 13. These are the first African-Americans who were commissioned in the US Navy. Um, a really remarkable uh, story um, because just by, by uh, comparison, you know, some African-Americans had been admitted to the Naval Academy in, 18, in the 1870s, but they were, we were driven out and were not able to graduate. Um, but it's not until 1949 that we have the first graduates of the Naval Academy. 1944 is the first, um, the first officer's commission. You know, the U.S. Army uh, had its first West Point graduates in 1877 and its first commissioned officers in 1865. So the Navy uh, had long been you know, the entire military was segregated, but the Navy was more so than others, um, you know, you know, prior to desegregation in 1948. Um, you also have women uh, that are entering um, the Navy, uh, and in this case, the Coast Guard uh, through the Women's Auxiliary Services, and, and African-Americans are let in uh, to these um, services towards the end of World War II. Uh, in 1944, we have the first women inducted into the waves, uh, and both of them, um, or two of them, two of the first ones that were, um, were inducted actually, both worked in New York City at the waves station, which is up in the Bronx, at what was then uh, Hunter College. Um, so that was uh, Harriet Ida Pickens and Francis, Francis F. Uh, Wills. Um, so they both taught up there. Um, the Coast Guard counterpart to that was called the Spars. And here we can see Olivia Hooker and Eileen Anita Cooks. Uh, and so they both worked at the Coast Guard station, which was down in Manhattan Beach. Um, and Olivia Hooker is a really interesting person. Um, she lived in Brooklyn uh, for basically her entire adult life. Uh, she was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, however, and her family left Tulsa in 1921 uh, as a result of the, the Tulsa massacre, basically the destruction of the African-American community and what was called Black Wall Street in Tulsa in 1921. And when she died a couple of years ago, she was considered the, um, the oldest, the, the last living survivor of the, of the Tulsa massacre. So she lived wow. to be, I believe, 100, 106 uh, or maybe 103. But anyway, yeah, so she had a, a long connection um, to, to Brooklyn uh, as well. Yeah, what a remarkable story she had. Yeah, yeah. So during World War II, you start to see more opportunities open up for African Americans, um, both you know within the Navy Yard, uh, civilian workforce within the Navy itself. Um, on the military side, you know we have the desegregation of the military in 1948 under Harry Truman, and so that obviously opens up a lot more opportunities. 
Um, on the civilian side, we see kind of a retrenchment though of the racial politics that existed before World War II because the majority of African-Americans working there were unclassified employees. And so they were let go at the end of the war. So we had a wartime peak of about 7% African-American employment. By 1948, it's back down to 2%. Wow. Um, however, there's only so much that sort of the entrenched white power structure can resist what's happening in Brooklyn because the African-American population in the borough and across New York City is increasing dramatically. You know, large numbers of people had migrated from the South and that migration would continue through the 1950s and 1960s. And by 1970, uh, Brooklyn is one third African-American. Uh, and so just, um, you know, by the sheer composition of the workforce that was available, you start to see the black workforce increase at the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, in the 1950s uh, and early 1960s. And so by 1964, um, we don't have an exact breakdown, but it's about 20% um, that is both African American uh, and uh, Hispanic uh, is the workforce of the Navy Yard. So it has become one of the largest uh, employers of, of Black people in Brooklyn by 1964. 1964 is when they are contemplating closing the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, if, if we can just pause for yeah. half a second here and go back to World War II, Elaine wanted to know about. Uh, uh, are you aware of uh, uh, black nurses in the waves? Is that something that uh, you can speak to? So the nursing corps uh, was actually separate. Um, so okay. uh, yeah, um, there. Um, so yeah, so the waves basically were. Um, uniform members of the Navy it was the women activated for volunteer emergency service. Um, the nursing corps um, was separate and actually goes all the way back to, to 1908. Um, there were African American nurses in uh, World War II for sure. Uh, what I don't know is um, were there any African American nurses that were serving at the Brooklyn Naval Hospital? Um, so that's a right. question that I should uh, definitely um, look, look into. Um, for sure. But that, that's well, let's question. get back to 1964. Uh, KSH wants to know who Bob is <laughs> in these photos here, in the uh, rally for Brooklyn Navy Yard photo. That Bob, Bob is Bobby Kennedy. So this oh. is a rally um, that is both for um, a campaign to save the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but it's also sort of a campaign rally for Robert Kennedy, who was running for wow. Senate uh, in New York State in 1964. And he made a central part of his campaign platform uh, to save the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and so this was a big event. This was, I think, in June of, of 1964. And all the Brooklyn bigwigs were there um, saying that they were going to you know, fight um, to, to keep the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't anything that Bobby Kennedy could do. He's elected. Uh, in November 1964, but they announced the closure of the Navy Yard uh, just a couple days after the election. Uh, so he's not seated in the Senate yet. There's nothing he can he can do about it. Um, and so we then begin this uh, basically 18 month wind down uh, of the yard until its ultimate closure in the summer of uh, of 1966. And uh, I think we're going to have to do a, a follow on program because when we talk about what happens to the yard. Uh, after the Navy leaves. Um, this is, uh, you know, a really, really important story in the history of, of Brooklyn's Black community because uh, a lot of um, different community groups really come together um, to try and uh, come up with a new vision of the yard um, as an industrial park um, that really um, puts, uh, you know, opportunity for the boroughs African Americans uh, at the forefront. Uh, and so when they build it, bring in a private shipbuilder uh, sea train in 1969, you know, by the early 1970s, then that becomes the largest employer of African Americans uh, in the borough. Um, and that's, you know, something that that really uh, continues today, you know, African American leadership at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, black owned businesses are a big part of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and, you know, of course, during this time period as well, we have the growth uh, of the Afro-Caribbean community in Brooklyn as well, who, who become very, very prominent uh, in, uh, among the Brooklyn Navy Yard's leadership and workforce as well. So there's a whole story to be told uh, as well post-1966, but um, 
I, I hope that I, I know uh, this is a long-winded presentation, but I hope that uh, it was it was insightful. And most importantly, I know for me, and I hope for our viewers as well, it, it opened up new lines of inquiry for for stories that um, are um, we we want to get a fuller picture of of who these people were and and what they did, um, and really you know incorporate this more into the story that we tell about the book of media art. Oh, we have some requests for the sequel, so there's definitely interest. And uh, I, I personally, I, I think that's one of my favorite things about Black History Month is it does uh, help us to focus attention on stories we might not look at otherwise. And uh, when we, we do uh, ask those questions, it tends to breed more questions. So this is, uh, this is a great, uh, great process that uh, we, we're launching into. Yeah, and, and thank you, Stefan. I'll, I'll pull my screen down now. Thank you, Stefan, for, for facilitating and, and asking uh, some great questions. I, I promised at the top of the show that I would uh, give some uh, book recommendations. Oh, yeah, uh, please. And we'll, we'll put them, uh, we'll put a lot of these resources again on our website so you can find them. Um, if you go back to the page where you signed up for this program, you can find them. Uh, this is a book, uh, pretty interesting, uh, little little bit dry, um, but a really important story to be told. It's called Divided Arsenal by Daniel Kreider, uh, and it's about segregation within, um, you know, the wartime economy uh, during World War II. Um, so that's that's a great book. Uh, there's a book about the, the Golden 13 uh, right here, um, which is uh, actually oral histories with these uh, 13, um, the first Black uh, officers, uh, it, commissioned officers uh, in the U.S. Navy. Uh, I also mentioned the book Black Jacks, which is really about the period prior to the American Civil War, uh, but is a, a really, uh, really fantastic book um, that's worth checking out. Another great uh, book about the story of, of this region, the African-American story of this region uh, prior to the Civil War is called Root and Branch um, by Graham Russell Hodges, which I also highly recommend. So uh, there's, there's a lot, lots, lots of books out there. Um, and many of them kind of touch on the Brooklyn Navy Yard because it was such a huge part of uh, Brooklyn's economy and uh, and social life. Um, but you know, we need to we need to do a, little, a lot more digging into this uh, into this story specifically. But yeah, well, thank you for for starting that process uh, with us and letting us uh, share in that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more. Uh, and. Uh, Hope that all of you will join us to hear more about uh, uh, nautical New York and about the culture of our region in upcoming programs. And we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Stefan. Everybody have a great day.